She'll talk to me a bit. <laughs> uh, hello, you there? Is it me, sir? Yes, you. Be you captain? Yes, damn your impudence. I be captain. Get up here. Show her the way you. And shove her along quick. She wants to go and be a soldier herself. She wants you to give her soldiers' clothes, armor, sir, and a sword, actually. Good morning, Captain Squire. Captain, you are to give me a horse and some soldiers and some armor and send me to the Dauphin. Those are your orders from my lord. Orders from your lord? Who the devil may your lord be? I take no orders except from the king. My lord is the king of heaven. This girl is mad. Why didn't you tell me, blocker? So do not anger her. Give her what she wants. They all say I am mad until I speak to them, squire. But you will see that it is God's will that you are to do what he has put into my mind. It's God's will that I should send you back to your father with orders that he put you under lock and key and thrash the madness out of you. What have you to say to that? You think you will, squire, but you will see it all coming quite differently. You said you would not see me, but here I am. You see, sir. Hold your tongue, you. Yes, sir. So, you are presuming on my seeing you. Yes, squire. Now look here, I am going to assert myself. Please do. The horse will cost 16 francs, which is a good deal of money, but I can save it on the armor. I will find a soldier's armor that will fit me well enough, and I shall not want many soldiers for you to send with me. The Dauphin will give me all I need to raise the siege of Orléans. <laughs> to raise the siege of Orléans? Yes, that is what God is sending me to do. Three men should be enough for you to send with me, and they will come, Polly and Jack. Polly? You impudent baggage! You dare call Squire Bertrand de Poulangy Polly to my face? His friends call him so, Squire. I did not know he had another name. Jack. Jack! That's Monsieur John of Metz, I suppose. Yes, he is a very kind gentleman. There will be no trouble for you, Squire. I have arranged it all. You have only to give the word. Well, I'll be damned. <gasps> no, Squire. Saints Margaret and Catherine, who speak to me every day, will intercede for you. You will go to paradise and be remembered forever as my first helper. Uh, is this true about Monsieur de Blangy? Oh, yes, sir. And about Monsieur de Metz, too. They both want to go with her. Huh. Hello, you there. Uh, send me Monsieur de Boulanger, will you? Get out. Wait in the yard. Yes, squire. Well, go with her, you dithering imbecile. Stay within call and keep your eye on her. I shall have her up here again. Oh, do, sir, in God's name, sir. Think of those hands, the best lady. Think of my boot and keep your backside out of reach of it. Oh. It is in service, Polly, a friendly visit. Here, uh, sit down. Now, listen, Polly, I must talk to you like a father. It's about this uh, girl you're interested in. First of all, she's mad, but that doesn't matter. Second of all, she's no ordinary farm wench. She's a bourgeois. That matters a good deal. Uh, her father came to visit me last year to represent his village in a lawsuit. A farmer. Now, I know, it may seem a small thing to take her away, humbugging her into thinking you are going to take her to the Dauphin. But if you get her into any trouble, Polly, you may get me into no end of a mess. Because I am her 
father's lord and responsible for her protection, so <laughs> friends or no friends, Polly, hands off her. I should as soon think of the Blessed Virgin herself in that way as of this girl. But she said that you and Dick and Jack want to go with her. <laughs> what for? Wait, you're not going to tell me that you take her crazy notion of going to the Dauphin seriously, are you? There is something about her. In the guardroom, it has stopped swearing before her. There is something, something, it may be worth trying. <laughs> Come, Polly, pull yourself together. I know common sense was never your strong suit, but this is a little too much. What good is common sense? If we had any common sense, we would join the Duke of Burgundy and the English king. They hold half the country. <laughs> the Dauphin is down and out, and we may as well face it. The English will take Orléans. The bastard will not be able to stop them. I tell you, nothing can save our side now but a miracle. Oh, you think the girl can work miracles, do you? I think the girl herself is a bit of a miracle. Now, Polly, if you were in my position, would you let a girl like that do you out of 16 francs for a horse? I'll pay for the horse. You will? Yes. Her words and her ardent faith in God have put fire into me. Ooh, you're as mad as she is. <laughs> We want a few mad people now. Do you see where the sane ones have gotten us? <laughs> but which way am I to decide? You do not see how awkward this is for me. Do you think I ought to have another talk to her? Yes. Oh boy. Joan! Lily, let's go, Polly! Come up! Come in. Shall I leave you with her? No, stay here. Back me up. <laughs> Jack will go halves for the horse. Well, sit down, Joan. May I? Do as you are told. <laughs> now, what's your name? They call me Jenny and Loren. Here in France I am Joan, and the soldiers call me the maid. What's your surname? My father sometimes calls himself Dark. <gasps> you met my father, uh, he- Yes, yes, I remember. Uh, you come from Domremy and Lorraine, I think? Yes, but what does it matter? We all speak French. You are not here to ask questions, but answer them. How old are you? Seventeen, so they tell me. Now, what did you mean? When you said St. Catherine and St. Margaret talk to you every day. They do. <laughs> they come from your imagination. Of course. That is how the messages of God come to us. Checkmate. <laughs> no fear. So, God says you are to raise the siege of Orléans. And crown the Dauphin king in Rue's Cathedral. Crown the Dauphin. And send the English out of France. Oh, anything else? Not just at present, thank you, Squire. Have you ever seen the English soldiers fighting? Have you ever seen them wandering, burning, turning the countryside into a desert? Listen to me, Squire. And don't mind me, we had to fly to the next village to escape from the English. Three of them were left behind wounded, and I came to know these Godams quite well. They have not half my strength. Do you know why they're called Godams? No, everyone calls them Godams. <laughs> it's because they're always praying to their God, condemn their souls to perdition. That's what Godam means in their language. How do you like that? God will be very merciful to them, and they will act like his good children when they go back to the country he made for them. Perhaps, but... You cannot stop them. One thousand like me can stop them. Ten like me can stop them with God on our side. You do not understand, Squire. Our soldiers are always being beaten because they are only fighting to save their own skins. And the shortest way to save your skin is to run away. Our knights only care about the money they will make in the ransoms. 
It's not kill or be killed out there. It is pain or be paid. But I will teach them to fight that the will of God may be done in France. They will drive the poor goddams before them like sheep. You and Polly will live to see the day when there will not be an English soldier on the soil of France. And there will be but one king there, not the feudal English king, but God's French one. This may be all right, Polly, but the troops won't swallow it. The Dauphin might swallow it, and if she can put fight into him, she can put it into anyone. Hmm. I see no harm in trying, can you? After all, there is something about the girl. Now listen to me, you. And don't cut in before I have a chance to think! Yes, why? Your orders are you are to go to Chinon under the escort of this gentleman and three of his friends. Your head is circled with light, like a saint. I wish she to get into the royal presence. I don't know. How did she get into my presence? I'll send her to Chinon. She can say I sent her. Oh, and the soldier's dress. Oh, I may have a soldier's dress, may I? Uh, have what you want. I wash my hands of it. Come, Polly! <laughs> uh, well, bye, old man. I'm taking a big chance here, but as you say, there is something about her. <laughs> yes, there is something about her. Goodbye. Frightened out of his wits. Lost man. Lear, I've just been telling the Chamberlain and Archbishop. The Archbishop says you're a lost man. This is nothing to joke about. This is more than we thought. Was it just a soldier? But an angel dressed as a soldier. An, an angel? angel? Yes. She made her way all the way from Champagne with half a dozen men to the thick of everything. Burgundians, Gallops, deserters, robbers, and Lord knows who. And they've been on a solace of the country book. The little G says that she's an angel. His Majesty. Oh, 
Archbishop. If you don't prepare to vote, of course, send me from Dacoulet. I'm not interested in the newest toys. It isn't a toy. However, I can get on very fine without your interest. Uh, your Highness takes offense very unnecessarily. You are always ready with a lecture, aren't you? Enough grumbling. What is it you have there? Well, what is it to you? It is my business to know what is happening between you and the garrison of Bacoulet. Oh, you all think that you can treat me as you wish because I am no good at fighting. And because I owe you money, but I have the blood royal in my veins. Control yourself. These outbursts of petulance are not seemly. Another lecture. Thank you. It's sad that despite being archbishop, saints and angels don't come to see you. What do you mean? Ask that fully there. Watch your tongue, do you hear? Oh, I hear. There's no need to shout. Why don't you go shout at the English and beat them for me? You young- Don't raise your hand to me. That's high treason. Steady, don't stay. Come, come, this will not do. And you, sir, if you cannot rule your kingdom, at least learn to rule yourself. Another lecture. Thank you. <laughs> Here, you read the accursed thing for me. He, he has sent the blood boiling to my head, and I cannot make out the letters. <laughs> I should have expected more common sense from Bergerkor. He's sending some cracked country last year. He is sending me a saint, an angel, and she's coming to see me. Me the king! You cannot be allowed to see this crazy wench. I can and I will. Did you know that my great-grandfather had a saint who would float through the air when she prayed? I will have my saint, too! <laughs> this creature is not a saint. She's not even a respectable woman. She does not even wear women's clothes. She dresses like a soldier and rides around the country with soldiers. Stop! Stop, stop, stop. Did you say a girl dressed in armor? Like a soldier? So Bojo called a scribe, sir. <laughs> well, by all the devils in hell, wait, no, what am I saying? Um, <laughs> by Mary and all the saints, that must be the same angel who struck down the freight dead for swearing. Ah, you see, a miracle. <laughs> Rubbish. And no one's been struck dead. A drunken blackguard who's been rebuked a hundred times for swearing has fallen down a well and drowned. A mere coincidence. Look, I do not know what a coincidence is. All I know is that the man is dead, and that she told him he was going to die. Ah, well, we can easily figure out whether she's an angel or not. We shall arrange this, though, when she comes here. I shall be the bomb, and we can see whether she'll figure me out. I agree. If she cannot find the blood royal, I will have nothing to do with her. It is for the church to make saints. I say the girl shall not be allowed. But you haven't read the end of the letter. De Beaujacourt says that she will come to us, raise the siege of Orléans, and beat the English for us. Oh, oh, oh rot! Oh, and will you beat the English for us with all your bullying? You have Jack Dumas, head of your troops at Orléans. The brave Dumas, the wonderful, invincible Dumas, the beautiful bastard. Is it likely that some country last can do what he cannot do? Uh, well, why doesn't he raise the siege, then? The wind is against him. How can the wind be against him at all on? It is on the river Loire, and the English hold the bridgehead. He must go across the river and go upstream if he has to take them from the rear. Well, he can't, because there's a devil of a wind going the other way. He's tired of paying his priest to pray for another wind. What he needs now is a miracle. Uh, it is for the church to examine this girl before anything decisive is done about her. However, since his highness requests it, uh, let her attend the court. I shall find her and tell her. John Bluebeard, let us arrange that you will be me so she will not know the difference. Pretend to be that thing? Holy Michael. <laughs> I wonder, will she pick him out? Of course she will. Why? How is she to know? She will know what everyone in Chignon knows. That the Dauphin is the meanest looking and worst dressed figure in the court. And the man with the blue beard is Gilles Duray. Oh, oh, I never thought of that. 
A miracle, my friend, is an event which creates faith. That is the purpose and nature of miracles. They are wonderful to those people who witness them and very simple to those people who perform them. That does not matter. An event which confirms or creates faith is a true miracle. Even if they are frauds, do you mean? Frauds deceive. An event which creates faith does not deceive. Therefore, it is not a fraud, and it is a miracle. Well, come on, or we shall be late for the fun. I don't want to miss it. Miracle or no miracle. Do not think I'm a lover of crooked ways. If I were a simple monk, I would appease my spirit with Aristotle and Pythagoras. Who the devil was Pythagoras? Huh. A sage who held that the earth was round and that it revolved around the sun. Huh. Watch him out to fool. Couldn't he use his eyes? <laughs> the Duke of. Uh, the Duke of. Uh, Attention! The Duke of Enemy presents Joan, maid to his majesty. Let her approach the throne. I wear it like this because I am a soldier. <laughs> Where be, Dauphin? You are in the presence of the Dauphin. Oh, come, Bluebeard! Thou canst fool me. Where be, Dauphin? You must speak to the Archbishop. There he is. <gasps> oh, my lord! I am but a poor country girl, and you are filled with the blessedness and holiness of God himself. But you will put your hands on me and give me your blessing, won't you? The old fox blushes. Yeah, another miracle. Child, you are in love with religion. Am I? Is there any harm in it? There is no harm, but there is danger. Oh. There is always danger, except in heaven. My lord, you have given me such strength, such courage. It must be the most wonderful thing to be Archbishop. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, your levity is rebuked by this man's fate. I am, God help me, all unworthy. But your mirth is a deadly sin. My lord, we're not laughing at you. We're laughing at her. What? Not at my un unworthiness, but at her faith? You are an idle fellow, Bluebeard, and you have great impudence to answer the archbishop. Uh -huh. Well said, lass. Well said. My lord, will you send all of these silly folks away so I may speak to the Dauphin alone? I can take a hint. <laughs> Come, gentlemen. The maid comes with God's blessing and must be obeyed. Allow me to pass, please. Beg pardon, ma'am, I'm sure. Be that the queen? No, she thinks she is. Ooh. Oh, pardon me, your highness, not to jive at my wife. Who be old gruff and grum? That is the Duke de la Tremouille. What be his job? He pretends to command the army. And when I find a friend that I can care for, he kills them. Why thus let him? How can I prevent him? He bullies me. They all bully me. Aren't afraid? Yes, I am afraid. It's all well and good for these soldiers with their armor that's too heavy for me and their swords that I can hardly lift and their shouting and yelling and bad tempers. Me? I'm sensible. I don't want to kill people. So if you're here to say, Son of St. Louis, gird on the sword of your ancestors and lead us to victory, you may save your breath to cool your porridge. For I am not built for that. And that's the end of it. 
blathers. We are all like that to begin with. I shall put courage into thee. I don't want you to put courage into me. Put the courage into the others. Let them have their belly full of fighting. Just leave me be. It's no use, Charlie. Thou must face what God puts on thee. If thou fail to make thyself king, thou wilt be a beggar. What else art good for? Come, let me see thee sitting on the throne. I have looked forward to that. What good is sitting on the throne when everyone else gives the orders? But if you insist, <laughs> Here be your king. Have your fill of the poor devil. Thou art not king yet, lad. Thou art but your boss. <coughs> I know the people, Charlie. The real people who make thy bread for thee. And they count no man king of France until the holy oil has been poured on his hair and himself crowned and consecrated in Ruth's Cathedral. I'm not such a fool as I look. My eyes are open. I can see. I know that one good treaty is worth ten good fights. If we make a treaty, the English are sure to have the worst of it. They're better at fighting than they are at thinking. If the English win, it is they that will make the treaty. And then God help poor France. Thou must fight, Charlie, whether thou wilt or no. But if we have a coronation, the queen will want new dresses, and we can't afford them. And I'm right as I am. As you are? And what's that? Oh. Oh, less than my father's poor shepherd! But thou art not lawful owner of thy own land of France till thou be consecrated. I will not be lawful owner of my own land anyhow. Will the coronation pay off my mortgages? <laughs> I owe money to even Bluebeard. I come from the land, Charlie. And I tell thee that the land is thine, to rule righteously and keep God's peace in. And I come from God to tell thee to kneel in the cathedral and give thy kingdom to him forever and ever, and become the greatest king in the world, as his soldier and his steward, his bailiff and his servant. The very clay of France will become holy, and her soldiers will be the soldiers of God. The English will fall on their knees and beg thee to let them return to their lawful homes in peace. Wilt thou be a little Judas? and betray me and him who sent me? If I only dared. I will dare and dare and dare again. Art for or against me? OK, I'll do it. I shan't be able to keep it up for long, but I'll do it. Hello, everybody come back. I have something to say. Mind you stand by and don't let them bully me. <laughs> Silence, please. Silence for His Majesty. The King speaks. We will be silent there. I have given command of the army to Joan the Maid. She is to do what she wishes with it. What is this? I command the army. <laughs> Where? Who? The maid? No. 
with just 10 men, I could hold them against an army. The English have 10 times 10 goddams in those forts to hold them against us. But they cannot hold them against God. I will take those forts. Single-handed. Our men will take them. I will lead them. Not a man will follow you. I will not look back to see if anyone is following me. Good. You have the makings of a soldier in you. You are in love with war. The Archbishop said I was in love with religion. God forgive me. I'm in love with war myself a little bit, the ugly devil. I like it. But you cannot fight stone walls with horses. You must have guns and much bigger guns. I like But a good heart and a stout ladder will get over the stoniest wall. I will be the first up the ladder when we reach the forts, bastard. I dare you to follow me. You must know I welcome you here as a saint, not as a soldier. I have daredevils enough at my call if they could help me. I am not a daredevil. I am a soldier of God. My sword is sacred. I found it behind the altar of the Church of St. Catherine where God hid it for me. I shall not strike a blow with it. My heart is full of courage, not of anger. I will lead, and your men will follow. All in good time. Our men did not take those forts by Sally across the bridge. They must come by water and take the English in the rear on this side. Then build rafts and put your guns on them and have your men cross to us. The rafts are ready, the men are embarked, but we must wait for God. What do you mean? God is waiting for them. Then let him send us a wind. My boats are downstream. They cannot come up against both wind and current. We need God to change the wind. Come, let me take you to the church. You can pray for a west wind. I have prayed, but my prayers have not been answered. Yours might be. You are young and innocent. Yes, I will pray to St. Catherine. She will tell God to send us a wind. Come, bastard, show me the way to the church. Bless you, child. Come, bastard. Captain, Captain, men move down. What is it? Kingfisher? <gasps> A kingfisher where? <laughs> no, the wind, the wind, the wind. That 
is what babies need. The wind has came. God has spoken. You command the king's army. I am your soldier. The boats are put off. They are ripping upstream like anything. Now for the forts. You dare me to follow? Dare you leave? Mind the tears. Make for the flash of the gun. The gun and say Dennis. Nowadays, instead of looking at them, people read them. I must say, my lord, you take our situation very <coughs> coolly. Very coolly indeed. What is the matter? The matter, my lord, is that we English had been defeated over and over again. That does happen, you know. It is only in the histories and ballads where the enemy is always defeated. Well, first Orléans. Oh, Orléans. I know what you were going to say, my lord, and that was a clear case of witchcraft and sorcery. But we are still being defeated, and now we've been butchered at pate. I feel it, my lord. I feel it very deeply. I cannot bear to see my countrymen defeated by a parcel of foreigners. Oh, you are an Englishman, are you? Certainly not, my lord. I am a gentleman. Still, like your lordship, I was born in England, and it makes a difference. I'm not ashamed of it. And by God, if this goes on any longer, I will fling my cassock to the devil and take arms myself and strangle the accursed witch with my own hand. <laughs> so you shall, priest, so you shall, if we can think of nothing better. But not yet, not quite yet. I should not care very much for the witch, but the bastard of Orléans is a harder nut to crack. He is only a Frenchman, my lord. A Frenchman? Where did you pick up that expression? Are these Burgundians and Bretons and Picards and Gascons beginning to call themselves Frenchmen, just as our fellows are beginning to call themselves Englishmen? What will happen to me and you if that way of thinking comes into fashion. Why, my lord, can it hurt us? Men cannot serve two masters. If this cant of serving their country once takes hold, well, goodbye to the authority of the feudal lords, and goodbye to the authority of the church. That is, goodbye to you and me. I hope I am a faithful servant of the church. And there are only six cousins between me and the barony of Stogumber. <laughs> but is that any reason why I should stand by and see Englishmen defeated by a French bastard and a witch from Mouty Champagne? Easy, man, easy. We shall burn the witch and meet the bastard all in good time. Well, you have first to catch her, my lord. Or buy her. I shall offer a king's ransom. Right Reverend Bishop Bouvet, Monsieur Cushon. My Reverend Bishop, how good of you to come. Allow me to introduce myself, Richard de Bisham, Earl of Warwick, at your service. Your Lordship's fame is well known to me. This Reverend Cleric is Master John de Stogumber. John Boyer Spencer Neville de Stogumber. At your service, my lord. Do us the honor to be seated. Well, my lord bishop, you find us in one of our unlucky moments. Charles is to be crowned at Roos, practically by the young woman from Lorraine, and I do not wish to deceive you nor flatter your hopes. We can do nothing to prevent it. 
I trust this will make a great difference to Charles's position. Undoubtedly. It is a master stroke of the maids. We were not fairly beaten, my lord. No Englishman is ever fairly beaten. Our friend here is of the opinion that the young woman is a sorceress. It would, I presume, be the duty of your lordship to denounce her to the Inquisition and have her burnt for that offense. If she were to be captured in my diocese, yes. Just so. Now then, I suppose there can be no reasonable doubt that she is a sorceress? Well, not the least. An errant witch. We must consider not only our opinions, but the opinions of a French court. And I am afraid the bare fact that an English army has been defeated by a French one will not convince them of any sorcery in the matter. What? Not when the famous Sir John Talbot himself has been defeated and actually taken prisoner by a draft from the ditches of Lorraine. Sir Talbot, we freely admit, is a fierce and formidable soldier, but I have yet to learn that he is an able general. There are some of us who may give some of the credit to Dumois. My lord, at Orléans, this woman had her throat pierced by an English arrow and was seen to cry like a child from the pain of it. It was a death wound. Yet she fought all day. And when our men had repulsed all of her attacks, like true Englishmen, she walked alone up to the wall of our fort with a white banner in her hand. And our men were paralyzed and could neither shoot nor strike whilst the French fell on them and drove them onto the bridge, which immediately burst into flames and grumbled under them, letting them down into the river where they drowned in heaps. Was this your bastards, Generalship? Or were those flames the flames of hell conjured up by witchcraft? You will forgive Monsieur John's vehemence, but he's put forward our case. Dumas is a great captain, we freely admit. But why could he do nothing until the witch came? I do not believe there was no supernatural forces on her side, but the names on that white banner were not the names of Satan and Beelzebub, but the blessed names of our Lord and his holy mother. Hmm. Well, what are we to make of all this? Has the maid converted you, too? When the devil strikes, he strikes at the <clears throat> Catholic Church, which is the whole spiritual realm. When he damns, he damns the souls of the entire human race. And it is as an instrument of this design that I see in this maid. She is inspired, but diabolically inspired. I told you she was a witch. She is not a witch. She is a heretic. What difference does that make? You, a priest, ask me that? Of all these things that you, call witchcraft, are capable of a natural explanation. The woman's miracles would not impose on a rabbit. She does not claim them as miracles herself. My lord, I wipe the slate clean as far as the witchcraft goes. But nonetheless, we must burn the woman. I cannot burn her. The church cannot take a life. And my first duty is to seek her salvation. Just so. But you do burn people occasionally. <laughs> no. When the church cuts off an obstinate heretic like a dead branch from the tree of life. That heretic is handed over to the secular arm. Church plays no part in what the secular arm may see fit to do. Precisely. And I shall be the secular arm in this case. 
Well, my Lord Bishop, hand over your dead branch, and I shall see that the fire is ready for it. If you will answer for the church's part, I will answer for the secular part. I will answer for nothing. This maid's soul is of equal importance to yours or your king's in front of the throne of God, and my first duty is to save it. You are a traitor! You lie, priest! If you were to do as this girl does, put your country above the Holy Catholic Church, you would go to the fire with her! My lord, I, I, I went too far. I, I must apologize on my own behalf. If I have seemed to take the burning of this poor girl too lightly, when one has seen whole countrysides burnt over and over again as mere items in military routine, well, one has to grow a very thick skin. Otherwise, one might go mad. I would assume your lordship, having to also see so many heretics burned, is compelled to take shall I say a practical view of what would otherwise be a very horrible incident. It is a painful duty, even as you say, a horrible one, but when compared with the horrors of heresy, it is less than nothing. I think not of this girl's soul, this girl's body, which may suffer for a few moments only, but of her soul, which will suffer even to eternity. Just so. And God grant that her soul may be saved. But the practical problem would seem to be how to save her soul without saving her body. For we must face it, my lord, if this cult of the maid goes on, then our cause is lost. May I speak, my lord? Really, Messer John, I wish you wouldn't. Not unless you can keep your temper. It is only this. I speak under correction, but the maid is full of deceit. She pretends to be devout. Her prayers and confessions are endless. How can she be accused of heresy when she neglects no observance of a faithful daughter of the church? A faithful daughter of the church? She acts, she acts as if she herself were the church. She brings the message of God to Charles, and the church must step aside. She will crown him in Ruth's cathedral, she and not the church. When in all of her utterances has she ever mentioned the church? Never. It is always God and herself. Well, what can you expect? A beggar on horseback? Her head is turned. Ah, but who has turned it? The devil. <laughs> And for a mighty purpose. What would the world be like if every common laborer or dairymaid whom the devil can puff up with the monstrous self-conceit of being directly inspired by heaven? It would be a world of blood, of fury, of devastation, of each man striving for his own hand. Let all of this woman's sins be forgiven, except this one sin. And if she does not recant to the fire, she shall go, if she were to once fall into my hand. Oh, my Lord Bishop, I'm not gainsaying you. But to my mind, there is a stronger case to be made against the maid. It is her idea that the king should hand over their realms to God and rule as God's bailiffs. It is a cunning plan to supersede the aristocracy and make the king's soul an absolute autocrat. Rather than being the first among his peers, he becomes their master. That we cannot suffer. We call no man master. I can see what is in your mind is not that she has never once mentioned the church and thinks only of God and herself, but that she has never once mentioned the peerage and thinks only of the king and herself. Quite so. These two ideas of hers are the same idea at the bottom. 
Well, my lord, if you will burn the Protestant, I will burn the Nationalist. But perhaps I shall not take Monsieur John with me there. England for the English will appeal to him. I know that the woman is a rebel, and that is enough for me. She rebels against nature by wearing man's clothes and fighting. She rebels against the church by usurping the divine authority of the Pope. And all of these rebellions are only an excuse for her great rebellion against England. Let her perish, let her burn. Well, my lord, we seem to be in agreement. I will not imperil my soul. I will uphold the justice of the church. I will work to the utmost to seek this woman's salvation. Well, I am sorry for the poor girl. I do hate these severities. I will spare her if I can. I would burn her with my own hands! <laughs> Sancta Simplicitas. Streets are full. They're calling for the maid. We told them you stayed behind to pray alone, but they want to see you again. No, let the king have all the glory. No, Joan, you crowned him, and you must see it through. Come, come. It'll all be over in a couple of hours. Better than the bridge at Orleans, eh? Dear Jun Longfellow, <coughs> I wish it was the bridge at Orleans, <coughs> but we lived at that bridge. Yes, faith, and died too, some of us. Isn't it strange, Jack? I am such a coward. I am frightened beyond all words before a battle, but it is so dull afterwards when there's no danger. So dull, dull, dull! You must learn to be abstinuous in war, just as you are in your food and drink, my little saint. Dear Jack, I think you like me as a soldier likes his comrade. You need it, little innocent child of God. You have not many friends in court. Why do all these courtiers and knights and churchmen hate me? I have brought them luck and victory. I have set them right when they were doing all sorts of stupid things. I have crowned Charles and made him a real king. Why do they not love me? Simpleton, do you expect stupid people to love you for shooing them up? Why, I should be jealous of you myself if I was ambitious enough. Jack, you are the pick of the basket here, the only friend I have. I shall go back to my father's farm once I have taken Paris. I'm not so sure they'll let you take Paris. What? Some would rather that Paris took you, I think. So yeah. take care. Saint Catherine. 
Catherine and St. Margaret and sometimes even the blessed Michael tell me things I cannot tell beforehand. And then, oh, then... Then we shall hear whatever we fancy in the booming of the bells. You make me uneasy when you talk of your voices. Well, I have defined reasons for you, Jack, because you do not believe in my voices. Are you angry, Joan? Yes! <laughs> no, not with you. You complain too little. Well, His Majesty is an anointed king at last. How do you like it? I would not go through with it again to be crowned emperor of the sun and moon. Those robes are dreadfully heavy. And that oil that everyone went on and on about, it was rancid. <laughs> Where's the maid? Sire, I have crowned you king and my work here is done. I shall go back to my father's farm. You will? Well, that will be very nice. I have not forgotten 
how the wind changed, and how our hearts changed when you came. But I tell you, your little hour of miracles is over. From this time on, he who plays the war game best will win, if luck is on his side. If, 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 if. If ifs and ands were pots and pans, there'd be no need of tinker. I tell you something, Bastard. Your art of war is of no use, because your soldiers are no good for real fighting. The common folk understand this. Do you remember the day in Orléans when you and your men refused to follow me into battle? You locked the gate to keep me in. And it was the townsfolk and the common people who followed me and forced the gate and showed you the way to fight in earnest. Are you not content with being Pope Joan? Why must we seize an Alexander as well? Pride will have a fall, Joan. Never mind whether it is pride or not. Is it true? Is it common sense? It is true. Fighting is not what it was. And usually those who are less experienced at it ought to make the best job of it. But Joan never counts the cost at all. She goes ahead and trusts to God. She thinks she has God in her pocket. But I can see the day when she will go ahead with ten men to do the work of a hundred. And she will be taken by the enemy. And the lucky man who makes the capture will receive 16,000 pounds from the Earl of Warwick. 16,000 pounds? They've offered that for me? There cannot be so much money in the whole world! Oh, there is in England. Now I ask all of you, which one of you will raise a finger to save Joan once the English have got it. I will speak first for the army. The day after she is dragged from the horse by a Gata or a Burgundian, and he is not struck dead, she will not be worth the life of a single soldier to us. And I will not risk that life as much as I cherish her as a companion in arms. You are right, Jack. I do not blame you. But France may think me worth my ransom after what God has done for her through me. I tell you, I have no money. And this coronation, which is all your fault, oh, has cost me oh. the last farthing I can borrow. The church is richer than you. I put my trust in the church. Woman, they will drag you through the street and burn you as a witch. Oh, my lord, do not say that. It is impossible, I obey. But you would not let them burn me. I have no blessing for you while you are proud and disobedient.
In my ignorance, I believe that you, who now cast me out, would have been like strong towers to keep harm from me. But I am wiser now. Yes, I am alone. I have always been alone. Do not think that you can frighten me by telling me that I am alone. For it is better to be alone with God. For his friendship will not fail me, nor his counsel, nor his love. In his strength I will dare and dare and dare again until I die. I will go out now to the common people and let the love in their eyes comfort me for the hatred in yours. You would all be glad to see me burnt. But if I go through the fire, I go through it to their heart forever and ever. And so, God, be with me. You know, the woman is quite impossible. I don't dislike her, really, but what are you to do with such a character? <laughs> if God is my judge, if she fell into the Loire, I would jump in in full armor to fish her out. But if she gets caught, I must leave her to her doom. Then you'll have to chain me up. Were I to follow her to hell when the fire rises at her like that. <laughs> there is great power in her outbursts. Yet she stands at the foot of the pit. And for good or evil, we cannot turn her from it. She would only stay quiet or go home. Give him some hint that he can have a word with me here before the trial, if he wishes. Yes, my lord. The Right Reverend Bishop of Bay and two other reverend gentlemen. My lord, this is Brother John Lamet. He is acting as deputy to the Chief Inquisitor into the evils of heresy in France. Brother John, the Earl of Warwick. Your Excellency is most welcome. We do not have the Inquisitor in England, though we do miss him greatly, especially at moments like the present. And this is Canon John Destive. He is acting as prosecutor. Ha! Prosecutor. I am pleased to make your acquaintance, Canon Destive. May I ask what stage the proceedings have reached? It is now more than nine months since the maid was captured at Compiègne by the Burgundians. Is this trial never going to end? It is not yet begun, my lord. Not yet begun? Why, you've been at it eleven weeks. We have held fifteen examinations of the maid, my lord. Six public and nine private. You see, my lord, I did not at first consider this a case of heresy at all. I considered it a political case, and the maid is a prisoner of war. 
for having now been present at two of the examinations. I must admit that this seems to be one of the gravest cases of heresy within my experience. Therefore, we proceed to trial this morning. I am determined that this woman shall have a fair hearing. Never has there been a fair examination within my experience, my lord. The maid needs no lawyers to take her part, all ardently desirous to save her soul from perdition. Sir, bend far my superiors in learning and piety, in eloquence and persuasiveness, have been sent to reason with her, to explain to her the danger she is running, and the ease with which she might avoid it. But well, we certainly do not share your pious desire to save the maid. In fact, I tell you all now that her death is a political necessity, which I regret but cannot help. If the church lets her go... If the church lets her go, woe be upon the man who dare lay a finger on her. The church is not subject to political necessity, my lord. You need have no anxiety in the matter, my lord. You have an invincible ally in the matter, one who is far more determined than you that she shall burn. And who is this convenient partisan, may I ask? The maid herself. Unless you put a gag in her mouth, you cannot prevent her from convicting herself ten times over every time she opens it. That is perfectly true, my lord. The hairs bristle on my head when I hear so young a creature utter such blasphemies. Well, by all means, then, do your best for her, if you believe it will be of no avail. I should be sorry to have to act without the blessing of the church. And they say the English are hypocrites. <laughs> you play your part, my lord, at the peril of your soul. I cannot but admire such devotion, but I dare not go so far. I fear damnation. If we feared anything, we would not rule England, my lord. Shall I send your people in to you? Yes, it would be very good of your lordship to withdraw and allow the court to assemble. <clears throat> ah, good morning, Master de Stogumber. I have to make a protest, my lord. Here is Master de Corcel, canon of Paris, who associates himself with me in my protest. Well, what is the matter? My lord. We have been at great pains placing an indictment on the bank on 64 counts. We are now told that these counts have been reduced without consulting us. Master de Courcel, I am the culprit. I am overwhelmed with admiration for the zeal displayed in your 64 counts. But in accusing a heretic, as in other things, enough is enough. Therefore, I thought it well to have your 64 obstacles cut down to 12. 12? Well, who will believe me, be enough for your purpose. But some of the most important points have been reduced to almost nothing. For instance, the maid has actually declared the blessed saints Margaret and Catherine and the holy archangel Michael spoke to her in French. That is a vital point. <laughs> you think doubtless they should have spoken Latin. <laughs> no, he thinks they should have spoken in English. <laughs> well, naturally, my lord. <laughs> As we are all here agreed, I think, that these voices of the maids are voices of evil spirits tempting her to her damnation, it would not be very courteous to you, Master de Stragumber, nor to the king of England, to assume that English is the devil's native language. <laughs> well, I protest. That is all. I submit to you with great respect that if we persist in trying the maid on these trumpery issues on which we may have to declare her innocent, she may well escape us on the great main issue of heresy. But is there any great harm in the God's heresy? Is it not merely simplicity? Many saints have said as much as Job. Well, the Martin, if you had seen what I have seen of heresy, you would not think it a light thing. When maids will neither marry nor take regular vows, and men reject marriage and exalt their lusts into divine inspirations, then as surely as summer follows the spring, they begin with polygamy and end by incest. Heresy at first seems innocent, even laudable. It begins always by vain and ignorant persons setting up their own judgment against the church and taking it upon themselves to be the interpreters of God's will. Therefore, 
You must be on your guard against your natural compassions. You are all, I hope, merciful men. You are going to see before you a young girl, pious and chaste. The devilish pride that has led her to her present peril has left no mark upon her countenance. Therefore, be on your guard. The court sits. Let the accused be brought in. The accused, let him be brought in. deserting the church, and that is heresy! That is great nonsense, and nobody could be such a fool as to believe that. My lord, do you hear how I am reviled in the execution of my duty by this woman? Joan, I warned you before, you do yourself no good by these pert answers. But you will not talk sense to me. I will be reasonable if you are reasonable. This is not yet in order. <coughs> you forget, Master Prosecutor, that the proceedings have not yet been formally opened. The time for questions is after she has sworn upon the Gospels to tell us the whole truth. You say this to me every time. I have told you again and again that I can tell you all that concerns this trial, but I cannot tell you the whole truth. God does not allow the whole truth to be told. It is an old saying that he who tells too much truth is sure to be hanged. I am weary of this argument. We have been over it nine times already. I have sworn as much as I will swear, and I will swear no more. My lord, she must be put to the torture. You hear that, Joan? That is what happens to the obdurate. Think before you answer. Has she been shown the instruments? They're ready.
seen them. If you tear me limb from limb until my soul separates from my body, you shall get no more out of me beyond what I have already told you. Besides, I cannot bear to be hurt. And if you hurt me, I will say anything you like to stop the pain, but I will take it all back once it is over. So what is the use of it? There is much in that, and we must proceed mostly. But the torture is customary. It must not be applied wantonly. If the accused will confess voluntarily, then its use cannot be justified. But this is unnatural and irregular. She refuses to take the oath. Do you want to torture the dog for the mere pleasure of it? It's not a pleasure. It is the law. It is customary. It is always done. It will not be done today if it is not necessary. Let this be an end to it. I will not have it said that we proceeded on forced confessions. My lord, you are merciful. I'm sure of it. Now it is of great importance to depart from the usual practice. Thou art a rare noodle, master. Do what was done last time is thy rule, eh? Thou what? Dost thou dare call me a noodle? <laughs> patience, master, patience. I fear you will soon be only too terribly banished. Noodle indeed. Meanwhile, let us not be moved by the rough side of the shepherd lass's tongue. <laughs> Nay, I am no shepherd lass. Though I do help with the sheep like anyone else, I will do a lady's work in the house, spin or weave against any woman in Rouen. This is no time for vanity, Joan. You stand in great peril. I know it. Have I not been punished for my vanity? If I had not worn my cloth of gold surcoat into battle like a fool, that Burgundian would never have pulled me off my horse, and I would not be here. If you are so clever at woman's work, then why do you not stay home and do it? There are plenty of other women to do it, but there is nobody to do my work. Come, we are wasting time on trifles. Joe, I shall put to you a most solemn question. Take care how you answer it, for your very life and salvation are at stake on it. Will you, after all you've said and done, be it good or bad, accept the judgment of God's church on earth? I am a faithful child of the church. I will obey the church. You will. Provided it does not command anything impossible. Oh. <laughs> She imputes to the church the error and folly of commanding the impossible. If you command me to declare that all I have said and done and all of the visions and revelations I have had are not from God, then that is impossible. I will not declare it for the world. And should any churchman bid me do anything contrary to the command I have from God, I shall not consent to it, no matter what it may be. My lord, do you need anything more than this? Cho, you have said enough to burn ten heretics. Will you not be warned? Will you not understand? If the church militant instructs you that these visions and are Dem demons tempting you to damnation, we do not believe that the church is wiser than you. I believe that God is wiser than I, and it is his commands that I will do. All of these things which you call my crimes have come to me by the command of God. I have said I have done them by the command of God. It is impossible for me to say anything else. Should any churchman say the contrary, I shall not mind him. I shall mind God alone, whose command I always follow. This is what I mean. This is You do not know what you're saying, child. Do you want to kill yourself? Listen. Do you not believe you are subject to the church of God and earth? Yes. When have I ever denied it? Good. Then that means you are subject to our Lord, the Pope, the Cardinal. 
archbishop and the bishop whom his lordship stands here for today. God must be served first. Your voices command you to not submit yourself to the church militant. My voices do not command me to disobey the church, but God must be served first. And you and not the church are to be the judge? What other judgment can I judge but my own? Oh, oh, oh. Out of your own mouth do you condemn yourself. We have striven for your salvation, even to the verge of sinning ourselves. We've opened the door for you again and again, and yet you close it in our face and in the face of God. Dare you pretend, after all you have said, to be in a state of grace? If I am not, may God bring me to it. If I am, may God keep me in it. Very good reply. Were you in a state of grace when you stole the bishop's horse? Oh, the devil. Take the bishop's horse and you too. We are here to try a case of heresy. And no sooner do we get to the bottom of that matter than we are thrown back by idiots who understand nothing but horses. Gentlemen, gentlemen, clinging to these small issues, you are the maid's best advocates. I'm not surprised that his lordship has lost his patience with you. What does the prosecutor say? Does he press these trumpery matters? I share the impatience of his lordship as to these minor charges. But with great respect, I must emphasize the gravity of two horrible, blasphemous crimes which she does not deny. First, she has intercourse with evil spirits and is therefore a sorceress. Second, she wears men's clothes, which is indecent, unnatural, and abominable. And despite our most earnest remonstrances and entreaties, she refuses to change them, even to receive the sacrament. Is the blessed Saint Catherine an evil spirit? Is Saint Margaret, <clears throat> is Michael the archangel? How do you know that the spirit who appeared to you was Saint Michael? Did he appear to you as a naked man? Do you think God cannot afford clothing for him? Well, <laughs> <laughs> Joan, the church instructs you that these apparitions are evil spirits seeking your soul's perdition. You accept the instruction of the church. I accept the messenger of God. What faithful believer in the church could deny him? Wretched woman, again I ask you, do you know what you are saying? You wrestle in vain with the devil for her soul, my lord. She will not be saved. Now, for the last time, is the matter of a man's dress. Will you cast off that impudent attire and dress as becomes your sex? I will not! The sin of disobedience, my lord. St. Catherine tells me I must dress as a soldier. Joan, Joan, does that not prove to you that your voices are the voices of evil spirits? Can you suggest to us one good reason why an angel of God would give you such shameless advice? Yes! What could be plain or common sense? I was a soldier living among soldiers. I am a prisoner guarded by soldiers. If I was to dress as a woman, they would think of me as a woman. And then what would become of me? If I dress as a soldier, they think of me as a soldier, and I can live among them as I do at home with my brothers. That is why St. Catherine tells me I must not dress as a woman until she gives me leave. And when will she give you leave? When you take me out of the hands of the English soldiers! I have told you that I should not be left night and day with the soldiers of the Earl of Warwick! Would you like me to live among them in petticoats? <laughs> My lord, what she says is, God knows, very wrong and shocking. But there is a grain of worldly sense in it. Such might be imposed on a 
Temple Village Lane. Oh, oh, if we were as simple in our villages as you are in your courts and palaces, there would soon be no wheat to make bread for you. That is the thanks you get for trying to save her, Brother Martin. Oh, we are all trying to save you. His Lordship is trying to save you. The Inquisitor cannot be more just to you if you are his own daughter. But you are blinded by a fear for pride and self-sufficiency. Why do you say this to me? I have said nothing wrong. I do not understand. Please, try to resist making such poor replies to us. Do you see that man beside you? Your torturer. But the bishop said I was not to be tortured today. You are not to be tortured because you have confessed everything necessary for your condemnation. That man is not only the torturer, he is also the executioner. Executioner, let the maid hear your answers to my questions. Are you prepared for the burning of a heretic today? Yes, master. <coughs> is the stake ready? It is. In the marketplace, the English have built it too high for me to get near to make the death easier. It will be a cruel death. You are not going to burn me now! You realize it's at last. There are 800 English soldiers waiting to take you to the marketplace. The moment your sentence of excommunication has passed the lips of your judges, you are within a few moments of that doom! <laughs> Do not despair, Jones. The church is merciful. You can save yourself. Yes, my voices told me I was not to be burned. Saint Catherine bade me be bold. Woman, are you mad? Do you now not see that your voices have deceived you? That is impossible. Impossible? They have led you straight to your excommunication and to the stake which is there waiting for you. Have they kept a single promise to you since you were taken at Copian? The devil has betrayed you. The church holds out its arms to you. It is true. It is true. My voices have deceived me. I have been mocked by devil. My faith is broken! I have dared and dared, but only a fool would walk into the fire. God who gave me my common sense cannot will me to do that. Oh God, be praying that you saved you at the eleventh hour. Amen. What must I do? You must sign a solemn recantation of your heresy. Sign? I cannot write. I can make my mark. My lord, do you mean that you are going to allow this woman to escape us? The law must take its course, Master Gase the Gummer, and you know the law. I know that there is no faith in a Frenchman. There are 800 men at the gate. Who will see that this abominable witch is burnt in spite of your teeth? Go face it, face it. Who is in the Silence! Master Dastigum, I submit to you to think about your holy office, about what you are and where you are. I direct you to sit down. I will not sit down. If you will not sit, you must stand. That is all. I will not stand. <laughs> <laughs> My lord, here's the form of recantation for the maid to sign. Read it to her. Do not bother. I will sign it. Come, child. Let me guide your hand. Take the pen. J-E-H-N-E. -E. So there, now make your mark yourself. There. 
God be praised, my brother. The lamb hath returned to the flock. Let me declare thee by this act, set free from the danger of excommunication in which thou stoodest. I thank you. But because thou hast sinned most presumptuously against God and his holy church, we, for the good of thy soul, do condemn thee to eat the bread of sorrow and drink the water of affliction to the end of thy earthly days in perpetual imprisonment. Perpetual imprisonment? Am I not then to be set free? Set free, child? <laughs> After such wickedness as yours? What are you dreaming of? Give me that writing! Light your fire! Do you think that I dread it as much as the life of a rat in a hole? My voices were right! Joan! Joan! Yes. They told me you were fools! And that I was not to listen to your fine words, nor trust your charity. You promised me my life, but you lied! Do you think life is nothing but not being stone dead? To shut me out from the light of the sky and the sight of the fields and flowers. To chain my feet to a log of wood so I can never again ride with the soldiers, nor climb the hill. <laughs> to make me breathe foul, damp darkness, and to take <clears throat> from me everything which brings me back to the love of God. When your foolishness and wickedness tempt me to hate him, all of this is worse than the furnace in the Bible that was heated seven times. I could do without my war horse. I could drag about in a skirt. I could watch as the trumpets and knights and soldiers and banners pass me by and leave me as they leave the other women. If only I could hear the wind in the trees and the larks in the sunshine and the blessed Blessed church bells, which bring my angel voices to me floating on the wind. But without these things, I cannot live. And by your wanting to take them away from me, or from any human creature, I know that your counsel is of the devil, and that mine is of God. <laughs> She is a relapse heretic, obstinate, incorrigible, and altogether unworthy of the mercy we have shown her. I call for her excommunication. Yes. Well, light your fire, man. To the stake with her. You wicked girl. If you count the will of God, would he not deliver you? His ways are not your ways. He wills that I go through the fire to his bosom, for I am his child, and you are not fit that I should live among you. That is my last word to you. Not yet. We decree that thou art a relapsed heretic. Cast out from the unity of the church. A member of Satan. We declare that thou must be excommunicated. We therefore do cast thee out, segregate thee, and abandon thee to the secular power. Into the fire with the witch! <laughs> this way, gentlemen! Burn this place. Right over there! Take her! See that everything is done in order. My place is at the time. 
when the file crept round us, she saw that I should hold the cross before her. I should be burned myself. She warned me to get down to save myself. My lord, a girl who can think of another danger in such a moment was not inspired by the devil. When I had snatched the cross from the side, she looked up to heaven. I firmly believe that the Savior here to the tenderest glory. She called his name, and she died. This is not the end of all, just the beginning. I will go pray among her ashes. I am no better than Judas. I will hang myself. After him, Brother Martin, you'll do himself some mischief. Well, hurry after him. Well, my fellow, who are you? I am the master executioner of Rouen. It is a highly skilled mystery. I have come to tell your lordship that your orders have been obeyed. Have it by your word, then, that nothing remains? Not a bone, not a nail, not a hair? Her heart would not burn, but everything that is left is at the bottom of the river. You have heard the last of her. The last of her. Hmm. I wonder. Ever since. 
Well, not so bad. Jill and Ashton led my armies to victory like you. <gasps> no! Did I make a man of thee after all, Charlie? It is Charles the Victorious now. I had to be brave because you were. Ha! I always was a rough one, a regular soldier. Now, tell me all about what has happened since you wise men knew no better than to make a heap of singers of me. Well, your mother and your brothers have had the case tried over again. And your jury found that your court was full of corruption, cozenage, fraud, and malice. Not they. They were as honest a lot of poor fools as ever burned their betters. Well, they decreed that a wonderful cross be stood for the state once stood, in honor of your perpetual memory and salvation. I shall outlive that cross. They will remember me when men will have forgotten where Rouen stood. There you go with your self-conceit, same as ever. You know, you might sing a word of praise to the one having justice oh, done at last. Uh -huh. Liar! Thank you. Why, if it isn't Peter Cochon! How are you, Peter? Now tell me, what luck have you had since you burned me? Are dead or alive? Dead. <laughs> Dishonored. They excommunicated my dead body, dug it up, and flung it into the common sewer. Well, your dead body did not feel the spade in the sewer as my live body felt the fire. But this thing they have done, it, it, it hurts justice, destroys faith, saps the foundation of the church. The solid earth sways like the treacherous sea beneath the feet of man and spirit alike when the innocent are slain in the name of the law and their good is undone by the slandering of the pure of heart. Well, I hope men will be the better for remembering me. And they would not remember me so well if you had not burned me. They would be the worse for remembering me. They will see in me evil triumphing over good, falsehood over truth, cruelty over mercy, hell over heaven. Yet, God as my witness, I was just, I was merciful. Yes, it's always you good ones that do the great mischiefs. I mean, look at me. I'm not Charles the Great or Charles the Brave. In fact, Joan's followers may even call me Charles the Coward because I did not pull her from the fire. Art thou really King of France, Charlie? Be the English gone? I have kept my word. The English are gone. Praise be God! Now is real France a prophet in heaven. <gasps> Tell me all about the fighting, Jack. Wert thou God's captain to thy death? I am not dead. My spirit has been called here by yours. And, and you fought them my way, right, Jack? The maid's way? Staking life against death with a heart held high and nothing counting under God but France. Free and French. It was my way, wasn't it, Jack? Yes, fate, and any way that would win. But your way was always the right way. I bid you best, Lassie. Perhaps I should not have let the priest burn you. But I was busy fighting, and it was a church's business, not mine. I blame the priest. <laughs> Yet I, who am beyond praise and blame, tell you the world is saved, not by its priests nor its soldiers, but by God and his saints. Drum, drum, trouble drum, bang and fat and rum dum old saint, mama dum pull his stale and stone dum Oh, my Marianne! What villainous troubadour taught you that dog roll? No, troubadour. We made it up ourselves as we marched. At your service, ladies and gentlemen, who asked for a saint? Be you a saint? Yes, my lady. Straight from hell. A saint and from hell? Yes, noble captain. I get a day off every year, you know. That's my allowance for my one good action. Which was? Well, the silliest thing ever. We tried to stick together and gave them to a poor lass who was going to be burned. Why? Who told you that? Never mind. Would you remember her if you saw her again? Uh, not I. There are so many girls. <laughs> and we all expect to remember them as if they was the only one in the world. <laughs> uh, 
I get a day off every year for her. So until 12 o'clock punctually. And after 12? Well, after 12, back to the only place fit for the likes of me. Suits me somehow. I had thought the day off at first was dull. Sort of like a wet Sunday. But I don't mind it much now. What is hell like? Oh, jolly. Tip top company too. Emperors and popes and kings. <laughs> Politicians. <laughs> oh, I they chip me about giving that young Judy the cross. But I don't care. I tells them all proper. Uh, and I tell them if she didn't deserve it, she'd be where they are now. That dumbfounds them, that does. Oh, excuse me, gentle lords and ladies. Only a poor old harmless English rector, John Distogumba, at your service. Poor old John, what brought thee to this state? Oh, a great shock. I did a very cruel thing once, because I did not know what cruelty was like. I had not seen it, you know. Must then a Christ perish in torment in every age to save those that have no imagination? Well, if I had saved all of those, he would have been cruel to if he had not been cruel to me. I was not burned for nothing, was I? Oh, no. You were not she. My sight is bad, and uh, I can't distinguish your features. But you were not she. Oh, no. She was burned to a cinder. Dead and gone. Dead and gone. She is more alive than you, old man. Her heart would not burn. She is up and alive everywhere. Madam, my congratulations on your rehabilitation. <laughs> Seems I owe you an apology. Oh, please, do not mention it. The burning was purely political. There were no personal feelings against you, I assure you. <laughs> I bear no malice, my lord. Well, it is very good of you to meet me that way. A touch of true breeding. Still, I must insist on apologizing most amply. You see, sometimes these political necessities turn out to be political blunders. And this one was a veritable howler. For your spirit conquered us, madam. Aye, perhaps just a little, you funny man. Still, when they make you a saint, you will owe your halo to me, just as this lucky monarch owes his crown to you. Fancy me a saint. <gasps> what would St. Catherine and St. Margaret say if the farm girl was cocked up beside them? <laughs> Why this mirth, gentlemen? Madam, my congratulations on having invented a most extraordinarily comic dress. You are all in fancy dress. I am properly dressed. I have been sent to announce to you that Joan of Arc, formerly known as the Maid, Having been the subject of an inquiry instituted by the Bishop of Orléans. Oh, they still remember me in Orléans? <clears throat> by the Bishop of Orléans, into the claim of the said Joan of Arc to be canonized as a saint. But I never made any such claim. <clears throat> the church has examined this claim, and having admitted said Joan successively to the ranks of the venerable and blessed. Me? Venerable? Has finally declared her to have been endowed with virtues and favored with private revelations and calls the said venerable and blessed Joan to the communion of the church triumphant as Saint Joan. Saint Joan! On every 30th day of May, there shall be celebrated a special office in commemoration of her, and it shall be lawful and laudable for the faithful to kneel and address their prayers through her. No, it is for the saints to kneel. In Basilica Vaticana, the 16th day of May, 1920. Half hour to burn you, and four centuries to find out the truth about you. <laughs> My sword shall conquer yet, the sword that never struck a blow. 
though men have destroyed my body, yet in my soul <coughs> I have seen God. The foolish old men on their deathbeds praise thee, for their sins against thee are turned to blessings. The cunning counselors praise thee, for thou hast cut the knots in which they have tied their own souls. The dying soldiers praise thee, for thou art their shield of glory between them and the judgment. The unpretending praise thee, for thou hast shouldered upon yourself the burdens that are too heroic for them. The wicked in hell praise thee, for showing them that the unquenchable fire is a holy fire. The maids in the field praise thee, for thou hast lifted their eyes and showed them there is nothing between them and heaven. And the tormentors and executioners praise thee, because thou hast shown that their hands are guiltless to the death of the soul. Woe be unto me when all men praise me! Now, I bid thee remember, I am a saint, and I can work miracles. Tell me, should I rise from the dead and come back among you as a living woman? <laughs> The heretic is always better off dead, and mortal eyes cannot distinguish between the saint and the heretic. <laughs> it is shown we are not yet good enough for you. I shall go back to my bed. <laughs> we do sincerely apologize, but political necessities, though sometimes erroneous, are still imperative. So if you will be good enough to excuse me. Oh, do not come back! You must not come back! I must die in peace! Bring us peace in our time, O oh Lord! As a master of my profession, I must take time and consider its interests. <laughs> except for me and this black guard here who has to go back to hell at 12. <laughs> what can I do except follow the example Jack Jinwa has set for me and go to bed? Good night, Charlie. Good night. <laughs> and you, my one faithful, what comfort have you for St. Joan? Well, all these emperors and kings and popes and whatnot, they just leave you in the ditch to bleed to death. And the next thing you know, you made them down there. Well, yes, they give themselves. What I'm saying is you have a good or right to your notions as they have to theirs, even more so. So what I'm saying is, excuse me, a rather pressing appointment. <laughs> Thy saints. 